Good morning. Hello. We're just going to wait for a few minutes as people come on. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Just waiting for a minute. Good morning, Becky, John, Amanda, Judy, good morning. Good afternoon, Estelle. Happy Saturday. Our body is so programmed to wake up at 4.55-ish. Every morning, I was deep, deep in sleep, and then I just popped right out of bed, and I was a little bit feeling rudely interrupted by my, not even an alarm clock, just woke up. So give me one second as I gear this thing up. There we go. Um, all right, good morning, Leanne, Phyllis, good morning. That's a barista hour. <laughs> yeah, it's early. Um, yeah, yesterday, guys, I was, I showed up, there was no coffee, I was just in a funk yesterday, I don't know if you guys caught that, but I just felt like there wasn't a lot of value, so we kept it fairly short yesterday, um, yeah, yeah, but we're here, good morning, Gary, good morning, Sarah, uh, Sarah, you working out with Gary, do you, do, uh, <laughs> I know both of you guys from the same gym, but I just don't know if you guys are still in the same club. All right, we're just going to get started here in a minute. It is Saturday. I am considering, every week I consider this, but I'm considering uh, taking Saturdays off. Good morning, Brenda. Um, I'm considering taking Saturdays off in the future and just doing Monday through Friday. Um, so we'll see. Uh, We'll see that. We'll see about next uh, ne next Saturday. Uh, I I stay pretty busy on Saturdays during the day, so it's not really a day off. But considering it, we'll see. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Should we get started? Is it time? Six oh two. This may be us. We got twelve. Saturdays are always a little different. We did have one Saturday where we had a bunch of a bunch of people. John says no. Don't do that. I got a D layer. It's a little bit warm here in San Diego. Inside. The building. All right. Tell you what, never mind. I won't tell you what. Let's carry on. Let's get going. Um, ha ha ha. Judy says she thinks I should take Saturday off. Judy and John, you guys get a fight. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I like doing this. I do like doing this. Um, Saturday starts the long weekend. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray and get going, guys. We got we got some stuff to cover, a lot of verses. I think there's some good stuff here. Whether or not we see it, we'll see. Uh, good call, Darren. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that uh, you would just continue to teach us and grow us and lead us. I thank you for these guys getting up even on a Saturday morning to be in the word with me and um, Lord just be an encouragement to me I do take encouragement from this as I know they do as well and we pray that you would have your way with what we talk about today that you would teach us things I know that there's some massively profound things in this passage and we don't want to miss it so we just ask that you would show us uh, what you have for us in Jesus name amen all right uh, don't want me to get burnt out thank you Judy I appreciate that um, yeah, I always, here's the thing, I always come away from this when I'm done. Uh, I always come away encouraged, strengthened. Yesterday I was a little off, but um, most days I come away very encouraged. Um, and so I like doing this, even though sometimes going into it, I, I feel like, oh man, I got to do this again. Uh, but by the time I'm done, I always am lifted up. Uh, I think that that's just in part being with God's people, being in God's word. It's going to do that. It's going to have that effect. Um, so... I feel like we're okay that way. Uh, so, I don't know. Thanks, guys, for caring. Uh, verse a, Chapter 8 of the book of Mark. Grab a Bible, open it up. Uh, chapter 8, verse 22. We're going to cruise through the end of chapter 8 is our goal today. We've got 26 minutes is our goal. Um, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. So this is awesome. See, if we go back to what we talked about yesterday, remember Jesus was doing miracles. He fed thousands of people with very little food, um, and he multiplied the food miraculously. And then the Pharisees came and said, show us a sign from heaven. We want to see a sign. And um, so the Pharisees were just like, we just need one more miracle. We just need you to continue to prove yourself to us. And Jesus said, no, this generation, you're not getting a sign. You're not going to get a miracle. Um, but then when they come to Jesus and they bring a blind man to Jesus, he happily engages and he happily works and heals and has compassion. Um, it's, it's interesting because oftentimes we think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get Jesus to do something that I want him to do. I, I'm going to get see if I can get Jesus to do a, a, a trick, a party trick. I'm going to see if I can get Jesus to kind of prove himself on that scale. And Jesus does not respond to that. Jesus is not a circus act. But when somebody's in need, when they bring a blind man to him, even after he said that there will be no sign given, he does a, a miracle. He does something incredible where he's going to heal somebody in a way that even today, oftentimes, like doctors can't heal. So he's going to do something very miraculous, which in my mind would be considered a sign. Um, but he just said he wasn't going to give a sign to the generation, but then yet he is still merciful and does miracles and heals I think that that's awesome. So they bring a blind man, they begged him to touch him, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had, this is awesome, when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Now, this is the second time in a very short time in the book of Mark that Jesus, uh, in the process of healing, the last time he stuck his fingers in the ears of a deaf man and he spit, it doesn't say where he spit. He just says, it says he spit, and then he stuck his ears and uh, fingers in the ears of the blind man, and then the blind man was able to hear. Here he has a, I goofed that all up. Stuck his ear fingers in the ears of a deaf man, and the and the deaf man's ears were open, but also there was uh, there was spit involved in that. Here he actually spits in the eyes of this man, uh, and. Um, he took the blind man by the hand, led him to the to a village, and when he had spit in his eyes, he laid his hands on him, and he said, "Do you see anything?" I think that this is interesting. I don't know the details. I don't know why. Uh, you could speculate. I could speculate. This is one of those things that when we get to heaven, we somebody's going to ask Jesus, Jesus, why did you spit? Why the spit? Like that just seems weird. Now that may seem weird for our culture more than their culture because. Um, there, there, I have read some things and I've come across some things that they suggest that saliva was considered to have healing properties, uh, in the times of scripture, but Jesus would have known the truth about how this works. So I think when we get to heaven, I think that that's going to be one of the things, because I, I do think that there's more to it, uh, but I don't understand it. I don't fully understand it. Sometimes Jesus does things that we don't understand. It seems a little strange. Um, so but he spits and he says, do you see anything? And, and he looked up and he says, I see people, but they look like trees walking. So here this man was blind. And then he looks up and he sees people, but he sees them as trees walking. He sees everything's kind of fuzzy. You know, I can't distinguish between the trees and the people. I, I know they're people because they're not staying in one place. So he's got this, uh, He's got this partial healing. This is interesting to me. He's got this partial healing that has happened as Jesus has spit in his eyes and laid his hands on him. Um, and then Jesus, <clears throat> verse 25, laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly, and he sent him to his home saying, do not enter, do not even enter the village. Um, so here's, here's some thoughts that I have. Now, now not everybody's going to share these kind of thoughts with me, but I want to sh go down this road. Um, I believe that faith works. I believe that faith, when, when we are praying for something, I believe that faith works. I believe that there's a spiritual realm. I believe uh, that God is always moving, that there's never a time that we're praying, um, that, that we're asking God for something that, uh, that he's not moving in some capacity, sometimes very slow. Uh, sometimes very quickly, 
Um, but you know, our ex our expectation is that there's either healing or there's not healing, um, not that there's partial healing. And I, it's not only this passage, but kind of some other things that I've I've read through and um, thoughts that I've had about this that I believe that God is always moving. That we are, um, you know, if there's a sickness that we're bringing before God, that that prayer affects that sickness. And sometimes it takes more than just going one time. And you know, so often as Christians, we go and we pray and we ask God. God, will you heal? God, will you do this work? And, and then it's not healed instantly. That thing is not healed in the moment. And then we just conclude, well, I guess it's not God's will to heal. And it seems that we very quickly go to that place where we say, well, I guess this isn't God's will. I guess God doesn't want to heal. I guess God doesn't want to interact in this way. And, and I'm convinced that God wants to do more than we think he wants to do. And I'm convinced the Bible tells us, uh, Jesus tells us, persistence matters. Continually asking, continually going back um, matters. That's one of the things. Faith matters. Believing matters. It seems to be that there are different measures of faith. Yeah, keep knocking, keep asking, keep pursuing, keep going. Um, now, does that mean that, that every sickness will be healed if we continue to go? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, I don't know how it works, but I just kind of have this sense that there's a spiritual battle going on over your health, over your situation. There's a spiritual battle going on as well as what you're seeing physically. There's this whole underside that you're not seeing physically and that we can engage with Jesus and we can say, you know, in, in our prayers uh, that, that we're taking ground constantly um, and, and sometimes there's just too much ground to take. Sometimes I think that that may be the case. There's just too much ground to take for the amount of faith and time that I put into the prayer and the, the pursuit. There's too much ground to take, and, and sometimes we, we may lose that battle. Uh, but, but I do believe that every time we're praying, we're taking ground. Um, there was a story I've told before um, about uh, these, these little kids in India, and there was, they had a friend who was... Um, fighting with these like my terrible painful migraine migraines in another village and these kids would go day after day and they would just lay hands on this kid and they would pray for him and then they would go home and he didn't get any better nothing changed and he kept going back and forth back and forth and they did this for a, a short time and then eventually he was completely healed and um you know he was just re he was completely restored migraines went completely away uh, some believe that that was, um, you know, demons and things like that. I don't know the details. All I know is their persistence, their consistency to, con consistency to go and pray and lay hands on him. Over time, he got healed. I had a friend. His name was Gary. Different Gary than what we have on here. And Gary told me the story of before I knew him. He was an older guy. And before I knew him, he had hurt himself. He had hurt his back so bad. He was he was kind of in a wheelchair. He couldn't move well. Sometimes he could get around with a with a cane. Sometimes he, you know, he, he just had very limited mobility. And this went on for years. Um, and every single Sunday when he was at church, they had a time where you could go up and you could get prayer from the pastors. And every week he would have his wife help him to go forward and they would lay hands on him and they would pray week after week after week, year. I don't know how many years went by, month after month, at least a year, maybe a couple of years. And and he kept going forward and he kept getting prayer. And and one day he said he was driving home and his wife said to him on the drive home, she said, she said, you're not going to get better. You're not going to, this is, you're not going to get better. This isn't going to go away. This you're not going to. And he said in that moment, he really felt strongly. This was where God spoke to him. And he said, God's going to heal me. God is going to heal me. And it was, and, and he said it was like confirmed in that moment where she had completely lost faith and he had completely in that moment just felt like, no, no, God's going to heal me. We got to keep going. We got to keep doing this. And, and he said he just kept going week after week. And he said there was a day. There was a day he was sitting in his chair and I think his granddaughter came into the room and he jumped up from his chair and he went and he picked up his granddaughter and he said that was the moment he was healed. Everything changed in that moment. And, and when I knew him, he got around just fine. He was a hardworking, older guy. He worked, uh, worked at an RV park and he would do this stuff. And, and so I just, I, I find, I feel like we're taking ground. Sometimes we give up too early. Um, there's a spiritual battle going for your health. There's a spiritual battle for some of you guys. You, you, you've recognized that you've even posted about it. There's a spiritual battle for your kids. There's a spiritual battle that, that you're, you need to just, just keep waging war with faith. Hey, we're going to win this battle. We're going to be just fine. I remember talking to a father um, 
one time, and, and he was telling me, I remember somebody asking him about his son, and his son wasn't walking with the Lord, and this guy was a Christian guy, headed up a missions ministry, would travel, take people over the ocean to go minister to people, and, and I remember somebody asking him about his son, who was in his early 20s, and he's like, well, he's just paving his road to hell, he's just paving his road to hell, um, and I just thought, man, how dumb is that? There's no faith in that whatsoever. Here's another answer that you can give to the same question, you know, and I've heard this one before too. Well, he's just writing his testimony. He's just writing his testimony, just recognizing, you know, God's got his number and we're just going to keep believing. We're just going to keep praying. We're just going to keep pursuing and we're going to know that whatever garbage is going on right now, that's just going to be the testimony that God's going to redeem and he's going to use it for his glory. Even the mess, even the sin. Remember, there's, there's this idea of this partial this partial. Sometimes we're halfway there and then we give up and we don't want to give up. Here Jesus is healing this blind man and he touches him and he spits in his eyes and he says, what do you see? And, and he, sure, the situation got better, but he's not done. Don't give up. Don't stop coming. Just keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking, keep coming, keep requesting, be persistent, walk in faith. Let your language be a language of faith. So when you're not fully where you know that you need to be, where God can heal you, where, when you know you're not there, speak in a way of not yet. I'm not there yet. Don't speak of, well, I don't think he's going to do it. Don't let your faith be hindered to that point. There's a story in, uh, about David, the king. David was told by God that his child was going to die. Told by God. It was, it was a judgment against his own sin. And God told him, your child is going to die because of your sin. Now, sin has consequence. But the thing that I think is profound is David himself went to prayer and just pleaded with God until his child's life was, was taken, until his child died. I think that that's interesting. David understood something about God. Even though God said, your child is going to die, David, David still waged war in prayer and just and just pleaded with God, please have mercy, please have mercy, knowing that God oftentimes will relent. Oftentimes he will have mercy. Um, and so David would go into prayer and he was persistent, even though he knew the voice of God and what God had actually said. Are we that kind of persistent people? Are we, are we not seeing sometimes the things that God would do because we give up too quick and we just label, well, I guess it's just not God's will. I guess it's just not God's will. Let's keep going. Um, verse 27, and Peter, or sorry, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages to, of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? This is a big question. Who do people say that I am? Jesus asked that question. Who, who do people say that everybody's got an answer about Jesus? Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. Who do you think Jesus is? A lot of people will say, well, he was a great teacher. He was a great man. Uh, he was a prophet, some will even say. Um, a lot of people will say, I have no idea, and I don't really want to know, because if I know, then I'm accountable to know. Uh, I'm accountable for what I know. Um, but Jesus says to the disciples, he says, who do people say that I am? Uh, and they told him, some say John the Baptist. Remember, J Herod thought Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Elijah is the, is the prophet of prophets, really, in the Old Testament. Whenever you would speak of the prophets, you could even speak of Elijah as representing all the prophets. So some say you're Elijah. Um, as a matter of fact, there were also there's prophecies about Elijah coming back. Elijah being on the scene in the last days. Uh, Elijah being on the scene in the days of the Messiah. Remember, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. So there was people trying to understand Old Testament scripture and saying, well, Elijah's coming back. Maybe Jesus is Elijah. Uh, and others, one of the prophets, that you're a prophet, just like the other prophets. That's what people are saying. Verse 29, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? This is a key question right here. I believe that Jesus wants to bring every single person to this. The first thing is he's going to say, well, what is the world saying about me? Some of you may be watching this. You're just like, well, who is this Jesus guy? What is Jesus all about? 
And, and the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look around and you're going to read, you're going to Google, well, who is Jesus? Or you're going to ask people, or you're going to go to different churches, um, because really, truly, different religions believe different things about Jesus. Uh, the, the Mormons have one idea of who Jesus is. The, 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 Catholic, the Catholic Church kind of represents Jesus in a certain way. Um, the Protestant Church represents Jesus in a certain way. Even uh, Muslims really have a belief about Jesus. And so all of the, because Jesus kind of fit within, within history. And so what you'll do first is you'll just look out there and you'll say, well, what does everybody say about Jesus? What is everybody else saying about Jesus? But then Jesus, where he wants to bring you, no matter what your background is, no matter what your religion is, what Jesus wants to do is he wants to ask you personally, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who am I? Um, and Peter said, you are the Christ. The Christ is the Greek. Messiah is the Hebrew. You are the chosen one. You are the one that was spoken of before now, the one that was prophesied who is to come. You are the, you are the one that was sent from God. That's who you are. You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now, G now in Matthew's gospel, we see that Jesus commends Peter for his, his understanding on this, that they recognize you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Um, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and, he reje and, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said, to, and he said this plainly. So after they understand he is the Christ, then he begins to teach them what is going to happen to him. Because the idea, the, the, the thought that they would have had was the Christ is to come. The Messiah is going to come. And when the Messiah comes on the scene, he's going to overthrow the Romans. And he's going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. And, and his, those who are on his side will reign with him. Uh, and, and they want to be with him. They recognize you are the Christ. And their minds is, they're, they're, the picture in their mind is wrong. Um, Knowing who he is, that he is the Christ, that is correct. The part where they're wrong is they, they have this belief that the Messiah, the Christ who is to come, is going to be a political leader in their day. And so Jesus instantly recognizing, yes, you get it. I am the chosen one sent from God, but here's the truth. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Romans. I'm going to be killed by the Jewish leaders. I'm going to be lifted up on a cross, but in three days after that, I will be raised from the dead. I will not be your political leader. This isn't about your overthrowing your and getting the politics right in your nation. That's not what the goal of this thing is. When I come, I will be, when, when I'm lifted up, I will be executed. I will be killed. Uh, and he, he's teaching them something contrary to their previous belief of what the Christ was to do. And it's, I love verse 32. It says, and he said this plainly. I mean, it was, there was no mistake about what he was saying. We know because we've been through Matthew and some of you have been around the, the Bible for a long time. You know this, that the disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand that what Jesus was saying was not a parable. This was not a picture. This was literal. This was, I am going to die. They didn't get it not because he didn't communicate it clearly. They didn't get it because they were believing something completely contrary. They were believing what, what was popular about the Messiah who was to come. They recognized who he was. They just didn't understand why he came. Verse 32, he said this to them plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Sometimes when we are in a disagreement with somebody, there's, there's so many different responses. When somebody's, in, when somebody's wrong, right? Uh, somebody like Peter is wrong. They're, they're saying the wrong thing. They pulled Jesus aside and they're just like, Jesus, you're wrong. There's a couple things. Um, there's a couple goals that we can have, I think. Goal number one is that we're, we're trying to set that person right. We're, we're trying to set Peter straight. Peter, you're getting this wrong. And so we're going to rebuke him so that... Uh, so that he, he gets corrected in his belief. The other thing is for Jesus here, he's looking at the disciples. He's looking at the rest of them. And he's seeing Peter rise up and, and rebuke Jesus. And, and in P, in Jesus, when Jesus rebukes Peter, whether it changes Peter's mind or not, 
it is, uh, it is teaching the other disciples. I hope that makes sense. So oftentimes when Jesus would call out the Pharisees, when Jesus would speak out against the Pharisees to the Pharisees, I don't know that his goal was to change the mind of the Pharisees. I think his goal was to speak to the people who were watching, people who were listening, the disciples and all the crowds who were around. That so, we, we need to, when we get into a debate, when we get into an argument, we need to know why are we in that argument? Why are we trying to win that argument? Why are we in that discussion in the first place? And I think that there's a couple of reasons. Number one, our goal should be to correct the person who's, who's wrong perhaps. But most of the time, that's not effective. Most of the time, you know, the Pharisees aren't going to change their minds. So the other reason why we're in that debate or discussion is to teach the other people who are listening. There have been times, I've been in Bible studies, I've been in groups where, where I've been in dis debate with somebody. And the only reason why I'm engaging in that debate is because there are other people who are listening. And I want to make my point so that they learn, knowing that the person who's arguing with me, that person who's going back and forth with me, they're not changing their mind at all. So, so my goal is to teach. And, and I believe that here Jesus is, is trying to teach the disciples. Now, Peter, thankfully, has a, has a heart towards God. And so he truly will be, uh, his mind will be changed as time goes on. But, but here Jesus is recognizing that the disciples all are listening as Peter is rebuking Jesus. And so it says that he turns to seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Um, matter of fact, Paul the Apostle Paul calls out Peter in the book of Acts because Peter is behaving in a way that is not appropriate for his position in leadership. And so Peter or Paul calls out Peter publicly. It's a lot of Ps. Uh, Paul calls out Peter publicly in front of everybody else so that they recognize it's a teaching opportunity. Uh, Peter was not treating the Gentiles properly. And then, so Peter says, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Paul says, what you're doing is wrong, Peter. And he does it to, to teach the people who are listening. Hope all that made sense. Just fast forward if you're, if you're watching this later in the day and you can, right? Um, but so Jesus pulls Peter aside. He's, he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So as Peter pulls Jesus aside, what's his, what's his, what's his agenda? Jesus, come on, man. Don't talk about death. Don't talk about suffering. Don't talk about Romans, you know, overthrowing you. We got a bright future ahead of us. Don't talk about all that kind of stuff. Talk about where we're going to go. We're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to set up a kingdom. We're, you got followers. There's thousands of people that want to be right where you are. You have superpowers. You can walk on water. We've seen it happen. You can feed hungry people. That's going to get you popularity. You got all this stuff going for you, Jesus. Why would you talk about suffering and death? And Jesus says, no, nah, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Man's concerned about all that stuff, about position, about power. But listen, you set your heart on the things of God. Lay yourself down for that reason. He's going to expound even further. Verse 34, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, this is before Jesus has gone to the cross, but they're not unfamiliar with the cross. Today, the cross is something that dangles from earrings, or it's something that we put around our neck, or maybe it's some symbol we get on our t-shirt, or perhaps a tattoo that we like to wear. That's what we see when we see a cross. A cross is kind of a cool little symbol. In their day, the cross was an instrument of death. In their day, there were, there were streets that had crosses lining the streets, and there were people dying on those crosses right in front of them. It was not a secret place where they did uh, lethal injection to be more humane when they were taking somebody's life, but they wanted, when, when a criminal was killed, they wanted it to be a statement to everybody that you do not break the law. And so people would line the streets, uh, criminals would line the streets hanging on crosses. And so here Jesus, it said even that they were in Caesarea Philippi. I, I don't know a ton about this area. I know a little bit about Philippi. It was kind of like a little Rome uh, Philippi was. Um, I know that from my study in the book of Philippians. And so it's like this little Rome. And so Rome had a, a very massive dominance in this area. And there were likely, uh, you know, punishment going on. Criminals would hang on crosses. Roman soldiers had put them there. 
And, and so Jesus in that context says, if you want to follow me, you'll take up your cross. You'll take up your cross and follow me. You will deny yourself. There is a power in not caring if you die. There's a power in that. There, I was thinking, it was reminded this morning as I was thinking through this, uh, there's a movie called First Night. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was like 1995. And it was Sean Connery, he was King Arthur, and Richard Gere was Lancelot. And I remember a scene in the movie that stood out to me even when I was in high school watching this movie. And Lancelot is fighting. He's, he's in this sword fight with this guy and uh, in, in more of a sport type of thing. And he's just so much better, and he dominates this guy. And the guy asks him, he says, how do, you get, how do you get to be where you are as a swordsman? And he goes through, he says, man, years of training. And he's like, I've trained. I've, I've put in the time. And, and he says, one thing that you, that you lack, one other thing that you need, you cannot care if you live or die. You cannot care if you live or die. You have to basically embrace the fact that you may die. Um, isn't that the Christian walk? effectiveness in the Christian walk. You just, you embrace death, truly. You embrace the cross. Embracing the cross means a couple of things, but one, it's I'm no longer afraid to die. I'm no longer afraid of what happens to me because I'm living for the glory of God, and I know that eternity is much, much longer than what I have here, that life is a vapor, it says in James. Life is a vapor. Eternity is forever. But there's this other side of, of taking up the cross as well. That the cross is that we embrace the fact that we in ourselves can do nothing. That we lay ourselves down even while we live. And we embrace the cross saying, you know what, the cross covers me. I'm already, I've already died. I've already given my life up. I've already stopped trying to earn righteousness through my works. And I've known that I've failed. I know that I'm weak. I know that I'm not going to live a perfect standard. I can walk knowing that the cross covers me, that the blood that was shed covers me. And so I embrace a cross, not, not in a works sense of, well, I have to drag this cross around in order to be accepted by God, but truly that the cross is the thing that I embrace that's, that says I am clean because of the, the work of the cross, not because of my strength to carry it. Verse 35, but whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So much of, you know, man, there's so much to this, this eternal perspective, isn't there? Um, the Bible tells us that we can invest in kingdom things, that we can invest our money, that we can invest our time, that we can invest our energy in the things of the kingdom. And, and truly, we will be rewarded in the kingdom of God, in eternity. We will, we will live so much based upon how we lived here. So we could store up for ourselves treasures on earth, and we can, we can live for retirement age, or we can live for luxury or we can live for eternity and we can store up, we can pass things ahead to heaven that lasts forever and ever and changes our experience of heaven. And truly, if we could live this thing backwards and see what heaven is like before we live now, I'm pretty sure we would give up everything to, 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 to push as much as we can forward into heaven. I think we would, we would spend our money differently, spend our time differently, spend our energy differently based upon what we see in the eternal. But the one who wants to save his life now, that it's all about now, I got to live as long as I can, I got to stay as young as long as I can, I got to store up so I have as much as I can. I think that one, that one will, will lose more than he, uh, will lose more as, as far as what's possible. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The things that we're willing to trade our soul for, the things that people are willing to trade their, their possession, you know, tra trade, trade eternity for. Uh, Francis Chan has this illustration that he likes to do that is like he, he stretches this long rope across the stage um, and even around his church building. And he says, the rope represents eternity. And, and then he puts a little duct tape on the rope and he says, the duct tape represents 
uh, represents your life. And then he puts a little piece of red tape at the end and he says this red tape represents uh, your retirement years. And he says, he says, most people live their whole life, the duct tape, saving up and preparing for the red, the retirement years, this tiny little space at the end of your life. And he says, that doesn't seem very smart when you have this rope that wraps around the entire building and this rope represents eternity. And we could spend our lives preparing for the rope, the time that never ends, the length of, it just goes on and on. Or we could spend that time, that little duct tape part, if you're following what I'm saying, with that little tiny red spot that we spend all of our time just, you know what, if I can retire and I can go on some nice vacations and live in a nice house. And listen, sometimes God still allows for those types of things, that blessed retirement year. It's not, it's not to say that, that retirement is of the devil because it's not, but so often we trade eternity for that little moment. We trade eternity for that little tiny red tape on the rope that says, you know, hey, I got 15, 20 years of living the good life when I'm falling apart in my old age uh, versus living for eternity. Jesus says, what can a man give in return for his soul? What can he, what can he give in return for his soul? For whatever... For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. <laughs> it's hard words, isn't it? It's hard words to recognize as, as Peter is saying, Hey, Jesus, you're, you don't need to suffer. You can live the good life now. You can have it all now. You can set up a kingdom now. And Jesus is saying, no, you're, you're thinking of the things of man. These are the things that men are after. But the things of God are eternal. Go after the things of God. They're far greater. So many people that I know, so many people that I know, they, they had that moment where they were moving towards the things of God and the things of God were becoming so much more significant to them and they were becoming more and more heavenly minded. But then just like the parable of the sower speaks of, they it got choked out by the weeds of the world and the world came in and and change their perspective and, and time, you know, it just kept going, years kept going on. It's, it's, it's easy to live for God when everything starts falling apart, when, when the future plan starts falling apart. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, 9-11, remember that? Airplanes crashed into buildings and people died and, and it felt like our country was under attack and we're just like, oh no, uh, the United States has had war, uh, an act of war on our own soil. You remember that? What happened? Churches got packed out. Everybody was in church the following Sunday. People were going. It says there's no athe they, you know, people say there's no atheist in the foxhole. In the time of war, when your life is on the line and you know that at any moment you can step into eternity, you, at, at that point, everything shifts. But when we're living the good life and we get the promotion and, and you know, we make, we're making the car payment and we're moving towards, you know, everything's working. And this life seems like it has a lot to offer. So often the eternal things get choked out. And we begin to live for the now instead of for the then. And Jesus says, what are you going to trade for your soul? Because there will come that day for every single one of us where, where God will show us time is short. Time is short. Life is a vapor for every single one of us. My, my grandfather, I'm going to end with this. I'm already late. My grandfather... Um, it was, I don't know, he was probably 60 uh, or in his 60s when, um, when God got a hold of his heart. And he began to, to use the accumulation that, that he had um, gathered over his years because he was retired. And he began to use a lot of some of his money and, and he, used, he began to travel over the, over the sea and go preach the gospel to people around the world. And God really started getting a hold of his heart. And um, there, there came a point where he's like, what did I do with all of the early years of my life? Like, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Now, God totally redeemed it because he has, you know, he has the financial ability now to just like, hey, I'm going to go on a trip and he can go on a trip and he doesn't have to raise support or anything. He just sees the trip and he can go and he pay for it. So God redeemed what he had done in his early days. But there was this point of just like, man, I wasted so many years 
where I could have given that, those years to the Lord. I could have done so much, but I didn't. I was just living for me. Um, but man, God was gracious with them and redeemed them. So, um, <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, hey, that's all I got. You guys had a lot of comments today, so I'll read through them today for sure. Um, thank you guys so much. Hope that that spoke to you a little bit. Um, tomorrow we'll get into chapter, not tomorrow, so Monday we'll get into chapter 9. Tomorrow you're going to go find a church. If you can get out of the house, go find a church. Uh, go, go, go be physically with people around the Word of God and the worship of God uh, if you can. Um, anyway, awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Uh, see you on Monday. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm reading some comments, but I'll read those later. Later, guys.